Within 48 hours, the case of a missing mother had revealed itself to be a story of jealousy, violence, and murder. I had become irrevocably tied to this investigation, and it was far from over. After interviewing with me for hours, prime suspect Mark Castellano knew that the walls were closing in on him. His calm facade was fading fast. He said my questioning him was his breaking point. Soon after I left his family home, he turned himself in. When Mark called my producer to confess to Michelle's murder, her family was mid-flight, already on their way to meet with me. They had no idea what was transpiring. They still had hopes that Michelle was just missing. When their plane touched down, they received the news no one ever wants to hear, that the person they loved was dead, that she had in fact been brutally murdered and had died at the hands of the person they feared was responsible right from the very start. In this episode, we'll talk about that meeting with Michelle's family. What did they know? Why had they been so convinced from the very beginning that this man was responsible? You're listening to episode four of Twisted Love. Bringing a Murderer to Justice. I'm Dr. Phil. Green Chef is the first USDA certified organic meal kit company. Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from. Love switching it up? Now you can enjoy both brands at a discount with me. Choosing Green Chef means choosing real foods that support a healthy lifestyle. You can count on meals that are good for your body. Green Chef offers unique farm fresh ingredients and premium proteins. The beef tenderloin with tomato shallot sauce. Now this is a restaurant worthy meal that's guaranteed to wow. The paleo friendly meal is fantastic and simple to make. Robin and I have fun creating Green Chef meals. It fits perfectly with our diet and lifestyle. So go to greenchef.com slash 60 mystery and use code 60 mystery to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's greenchef.com slash 60 mystery and use code 60 mystery to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. The number one meal kit for eating well. I admire these folks more than you can imagine. In the wake of finding out about Michelle's murder, they still wanted to come to Los Angeles and meet with me. Until now, Mark had been the primary person communicating to the media. The whole story had been told from his perspective, and they did not like that. The picture he painted wasn't pretty. According to him, he was the father of the year, while she was essentially an unfit mother. Even while confessing to her murder, that was the story he was sticking to. Even while confessing to taking her life, he was still assassinating her character. It was now time to hear their side. They wanted to tell the story of the real Michelle, the mother, daughter, and sister that they loved. This new development completely changed the course of our episode. I had anticipated meeting a family that was still clinging to hope. Instead, they had just been hit by a tidal wave of grief. When they sat down with me to tape, I was incredibly impressed with how poised they were given the devastating news they had just received. But I understood why. They were on a mission. They were not going to let the world's impression of Michelle be formed by the character assassinating efforts of her killer. They were going to set the record straight. They wanted to tell the world who she really was. So I sat down with Michelle's mother, Donna, her brother, David, and David's wife, Jessica. Tell me 
how you found out about this. As soon as we got to LAX earlier, the detective called me that I had spoken to yesterday and informed me that Mark had admitted that he had killed her and that they did know the location of the body, but they could not disclose it to us at, at this time, so we were all Right there right on the there airplane, and, and we could tell by his face immediately. Take me through that moment as a mother when you heard that. I was um, looking at David. I could tell that he looked, started to turn pale, and his tone of voice changed. And um, I was just staring at him, and and um, I knew the worst I could tell. And um, my heart just sank. Um, you know, we want closure, but you always want to hope that, that your child's still alive out there. But of course, that hope was gone. They had to be shocked when they get off the airplane and find out what they had found out. Anytime you lose someone you love, there's going to be grief. But even grief is on a continuum. And by that, I mean, if someone is elderly and they're suffering a chronic illness, you really start the grieving process when the diagnosis comes in. If you're told that someone you love, particularly an elderly person, has a terminal disease, isn't that when your grieving starts? The minute you find out that they've been given a death sentence, they've been given a disease for which there's no cure, so you have an opportunity to phase into or ease into it. It's stressful. It hurts. The loss is the same. But you have a chance to wrap your mind and heart around it. But further to the right on that continuum, when the death is sudden, when the death is violent, when the death is criminal, that is the ultimate stress. And when the person is close to you, your own child or your own spouse, then suddenly it's as though you have no power, no control. And remember, when this family boarded the plane in Houston, they still were clinging to the hope that she was just missing. They landed to find out she was dead. So within the span of a week, they had to wrap their minds around first that she was missing to the ultimate news that she was gone forever. But they were offended. They were offended by what he was saying. They were offended by him, but they were really offended by what he was saying about their precious Michelle. They very much wanted to know about my interview with Mark and the sense I had gotten from him at the time. I knew I needed to be mindful of the family, considering the pain they were going through, but I also knew they wanted answers. They needed to know what he had told me. For them, it was a step towards healing. Like anyone in that situation, they were yearning for a way to make sense out of the unthinkable. You know, I talked to him. I sat down with him in Odessa, did not like what I was hearing. My training is in forensic psychology. And I said to him at the time, you are making a case for your guilt. I said, then finally you snapped. And you snapped and you retaliated and she wound up uh, seriously injured uh, or dead. And I said, you need to tell me that right now. Don't wait, don't go down there and confess. You need to tell me that right now. There's a child here in this house that's hanging in the balance. There's a family that is going crazy, trying to figure out where she is. You tell me now. And he paused. Look, there was no going back from what this man did. He had taken a mother of two away from this earth. But I wanted to convey to Michelle's family that we had given him the opportunity to admit what he had done, to put his family's anxiety and fear of the unknown to rest, to give them closure. I'd given him the opportunity to put his son's interest ahead of his own. Even if he had done something out of impulse, that if it had gotten away from him, he now had time to be contemplative. He now had time to say, 
I need to think about my son. Only a malignant narcissist would persist as he was doing. I think he didn't confess to me right there and then because he felt equal parts coward and cocky. On one hand, he didn't yet have the guts to admit what he had done, and on the other, he really thought maybe he could find a way to wiggle out of this still yet. I think he knew in his heart 100%. I didn't believe him. I think the minute I confronted him about the hard drives, he knew he had lost me 100%. When I sat down with the family, I talked to them about the days leading up to the murder. None of her family had talked to her the day she went missing. However, they had seen her that week because she had gone to see them to visit her brother's newborn. By their accounts, Michelle was in good spirits. She had just started a new job, but made it a priority to come over and meet the newest addition of the family. She was excited. They showed me a photo of Michelle with her brother and his newborn, presumably one of the last photos ever taken. She's beaming at the camera. She looks happy and proud, full of life, not a woman who, as Mark claimed, was strung out on drugs, not a woman who had the capacity to abandon her child and her entire family without warning. Yes, she had had problems in the past. Her family made no secret of this. This visit to her brother's new baby was particularly special to them because due to her past drug issues, she had missed meeting their firstborn. So for her to turn it around like this was a sign that she had made real progress. In fact, in recent years, she had done nothing but grow closer and closer with her family. They all had to make a decision about what had transpired in her life. They could judge her for that and see her with fixed beliefs, or they could recognize her real progress. They could recognize that these were obstacles she had to overcome, and overcome them she did. Also, keep in mind that it is hard to hide things from the people who know you best. This was her mother and brother who saw her mere days before she went missing. Now, I don't know about you, but getting something past my mother? No. Be like trying to smuggle sunrise by a rooster. She watched everything. And when I talked to Michelle's mother, it was very clear she was tuned in to her children. She knew what was going on. This was not some spacey mom that wasn't dialed in. She and Michelle's brother knew her better than anyone. They had seen her when she was under the influence, and they knew the telltale signs. According to them, they saw none of that during her final visit. It seemed like her life was on the upswing definitely on the right road, except when it came to her on-again, off-again relationship with Mark. I knew I needed to get into the relationship dynamic between Mark and Michelle, and what her family told me validated my previous observations. So you knew Mark? Yes. Did you like him? No. What did you not like about him? Narcissistic, and when I say that, I mean in a strong way, but he also appeared that something mentally or psychologically was not right. Tried to kill himself in 2009. People have described him as, quote, psychotic. Look, as a parent, we always say nobody's good enough for our child, right? And we just win the lottery if somebody comes along that we think is worthy of them. And so it's only natural that we continue to worry about their well-being and who they choose. They felt Michelle was clearly involved with a guy that had psychological issues. But sometimes when you're so involved with someone or something, 
It's like you're living in a Monet painting. You're seeing the dots, but you can't see the big picture. But the people that love you have some objectivity. They stand back and see the big picture. And they're the ones that need to say, hey, this isn't what you think it is. Things are not right here. I don't doubt that Michelle was smart enough to know that living with Mark wasn't going to be a long-term healthy choice. I think for her that at the time, she did it out of necessity. I think it was a short-term solution. She did not want to be in his clinches forever. She felt like, okay, he has the right to see his son. I need a place to stay. He's struggling. So we'll combine assets. And at this time, there was a lot of cohabitation. I had talked to people on Dr. Phil that had gotten divorces and agreed to stay under the same roof, to partition off the house, essentially, because it was the only way they could afford to split up. The consensus among those who knew her seemed to be that once she was more financially stable, her plan was to move out and get a place of her own. And I think she was very transparent with Mark about that. And those same sources also alleged that Mark knew full well that Michelle couldn't wait to get away from him. There would be a time when she didn't need anything from him, and he wouldn't have the satisfaction of knowing she depended on him. Mark was a controller. Mark liked to have leverage, And as long as he had that financial hammer, as long as he had that leverage, then he felt like that power gave him the ability to stay in her life. Like many relationships, theirs was a puzzle that her family couldn't fully figure out. Sure, it was clear as crystal to them. They were an odd pair. They knew they argued. They knew their fights could get loud and explosive. But at least at first... They didn't know of the supposed violence between them. Was she violent? Not that I ever saw, not physically. She um, was a debater. She would stand her ground, and she would tell you exactly what you thought, and sometimes not so kindly, <laughs> but um, and, and, and with colorful expletives sometimes. But she never, um, that I knew of, would get physically in your face. That was just not her. She... she She'd like to debate. We can't know for sure, but it could be possible that Michelle hadn't wanted to worry them. Perhaps she withheld certain details about their relationship. There was a time period when she tried to make their relationship work. And her family had seen how she struggled as a single mom when he essentially left her only months after Caden's birth. The family really didn't see much of Mark while he was romantically involved with Michelle. He didn't want to come to family gatherings or go places with her. His seemingly antisocial nature was off-putting, and really it was a red flag for them. For a woman so full of life and so eager to spend time with others, he seemed like such an unlikely partner. What did she see in this guy? Her brother recalled that in addition to being high-spirited, she was also someone who wouldn't back down from an argument. If something were to bother her, she'd say it right then or right there. When you have someone like her with a fiery, outspoken personality and you couple her with someone like Mark, a man who exhibited his need for control, well, what could possibly go wrong there? A lot. It was a toxic combination. No one knew how toxic. Prior to her murder, she did confide a fear she had to her sister-in-law. It would prove to be an ominous prophecy. Did your mind ever go to the point that you thought he would kill her? I don't know why she would tell me this, and I didn't believe her when she told me. She said, he's trying to kill me, Jessica. Can you imagine how that would make you feel in hindsight? Knowing that she felt her life was in jeopardy? They didn't like him. 
They were aware he had mental issues, but it's still a long way to murder. Couples fight, Mark and Michelle certainly did, but they hadn't thought that all of their problems would culminate in him killing her. I mean, think about this. It seems intuitively obvious when you look back on it. That's why the old saying, hindsight is twenty twenty" has hung around so long. You look back and go, wow, she actually said it and it happened. But how many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people have said the very same thing and nothing happened? It's kind of like getting in an argument and saying, oh my gosh, I could just kill him. I could just kill her. But people don't really mean it. They don't really think it's going to happen. And I wondered if this family was playing the what-if game. That's the game that can drive you insane. What if I had heard her more clearly? What if I had read between the lines? What if we as her family had given her a financial alternative so she didn't feel like she needed to turn to Mark? What if we had done things to let him know that we were monitoring every interaction every step of the way. What if, what if, what if? But that's unfair to hold yourself to that standard. Because what could have happened did. And it's unfair to expect yourself to be a fortune teller. I told him I had a phone recording of Mark's confession. Knowing the graphic details on that tape, I was very cautious about letting them listen to any part of it. But these people wanted closure. Their attitude was, we just heard that she had been murdered. Do you think telling us something now is going to be worse than that? We have just heard the ultimate. And you know, I thought at the time, I guess they're right. If anything doesn't fit in your ear, it's hearing that someone has killed your loved one. Anything you say is downhill from that. All three agreed that they did want to know. They were about to hear the truth from the man who had been lying to them from the very beginning, the man who had taken Michelle away from them. They wanted to know. They wanted to be there with her, but they couldn't be. They wanted to connect now by knowing what had taken place. I wasn't sure that it was the best thing to do, but I was sure that it wasn't my decision to make. I was sure that they had the right to whatever information they wanted, including the information I had. Is it all right if we play some of what you've said for the family? Because I know they're on their way here and and I know they're going to be wanting some answers from you. Is that all right? You can tell them. You can let them have all of it. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm not, I'm not hiding anything anymore. So, yeah, you can, you can have them listen to everything. That's fine. They just got to realize that, you know, that, like I said, this wasn't planned and everything, but at the same time, my little boy is being abused, and I couldn't put up a They were beyond outraged when they heard him say this. They vehemently denied that she was an abusive mother. She had an older daughter with her previous husband, they said, and his view of her as a mother was entirely different. While he had primary custody of their daughter, Michelle was actively involved in her life. According to them, Michelle and her older daughter were best friends. In fact, they said her ex-husband knew for certain that something was wrong when he had reached out via text to schedule a mother-daughter visit and then never heard back from Michelle. 
According to him, that was totally unlike her. She never hesitated at a chance to spend time with her daughter. She was caring, and she was involved. While listening to his confession, her mother Donna also remarked on how calm his voice sounded. It immediately struck them how detached he seemed from the entire situation. He was only concerned for himself. His level of narcissism was shocking, and I've seen my fair share of self-absorbed criminals. He was talking about this like he was ordering lunch. There was no remorse. There was no shame. There was no embarrassment. And laced throughout it, even while he was confessing the horrific nature of his deeds, he would take a break to say something bad about her. It's not enough that he killed her. It's not enough that he murdered her and then hid the body. He still had to gotcha with innuendo and accusations. What a cowardly thing to do when the target is not there to defend themselves. You've also got to wonder what kind of person in a nonchalant tone readily agrees to having their confession played for the family who loved the person they killed. That's a complete lack of empathy. He didn't say, you know, let me think about this for a minute. Can I give you a statement to read to them? Can I give you something where I can express my remorse, my shame for what I've done? Note that never once did he say, please tell them I'm sorry. Please tell them I pray for their forgiveness. He doubled down on the same excuse that his son was being abused, that she was a terrible mother, and that he was carrying out some act of justice for his son, that she triggered him by her behavior. In a sense, this was her fault. He couldn't take his son being abused anymore by this woman. She triggered him, and he took the moral high ground and took her out to protect his son. How ludicrous. How cruel. We're talking about a man who just choked the mother of his child to death. But to his way of thinking, if the family is upset, they're the ones who have to realize why he did it. It's their problem if they can't comprehend why he did what he did. Is he so narcissistic, so self-absorbed, so unable to quote, read the room, that he actually thinks they're going to see his side? Does he actually think they're going to say, well, I hate that he did that, but I can understand how he got so upset. I can understand how he was triggered. That is incomprehensible to you as I say that, but I can promise you it was not incomprehensible to him. He was so narcissistic, felt so special, felt so entitled that he really thought he could contextualize this, trivialize this in some way that they would offer him some degree of understanding. Now, that's just my opinion. I could be wrong. I'm not, but I could be. He showed zero regard for the family's feelings. He didn't for one second consider the pain and horror that they were going to feel once they heard what he did to her. How he choked her with his bare hands and then buried her corpse, all the while keeping up his dog and pony show that she had hit the road. He felt no shame. He wasn't embarrassed that he had lied to them. He wasn't embarrassed that he had taken away the little girl that Donna had given birth to, the little sister that her brother had played with in the yard. He doesn't think about those things. 
There's another huge reason why his excuse of killing her, quote, because my little boy is being abused, close quotes, makes no sense. If you're trying to save your child from abuse, why would you commit the ultimate act of abuse just feet away from the child by killing their mother? That does nothing but endorse abuse. He was okay with depriving his son of his mother. Let's stop and think about that. He's asking us to believe, to consider, to even contemplate that this was an act of protection for his son. And in the same breath is confessing to the fact that he has killed the child's mother, taken away the opportunity or ability for this child to ever crawl up in his mother's lap again, to ever lay his head on her chest, to put his arms around her neck, to feel her hug him when she comes home. He took it all away because he was threatened because he was irritated. He put his needs, his wants, his emotions so far above his sons, he was willing to kill the child's mother. It absolutely broke my heart when her family told me that right away when she went missing, Caden started asking for her. He had no idea he was never going to see her again. He wanted his mother. He wanted his mommy. He missed her the minute she was gone. But for Mark, that just doesn't register. It's his world and everyone else is just living in it. Because he wasn't hiding anything anymore. He felt it was okay for her family to know. It just wasn't okay for them to know the truth when he was out to save his own skin. It was not a shocking revelation that he had done this. The family had been wary of him right from the get-go. Is it helpful to you, Donna, to hear his explanation of this? Does not surprise me. We we were already pretty sure that, mm -hmm. that he had done yeah something with her at the very least put stowed her away somewhere and just was being mean torturing something but we felt that she was gone her. this is horrible to hear but at the same time not surprising not at all her intuition was right the only comfort i felt that could be gotten from this situation was the fact that now she didn't have to wonder if her daughter was being held captive, being tortured, in pain. At least she knew the truth. I hate the word closure. And people say, well, at least she's got closure. What the hell does that really mean? You don't get closure when you find out your daughter has been murdered and buried in a field. That's just information. You have another piece of information. It's another step on the journey. This was a time that it was very important for this family to bond and be together. Sadly, they had the common experience of all losing a family member thought it was really important that they talk about this, that they share memories, anecdotes, that they keep the person's spirit alive. And it was really important to me that they didn't play that what if game, that they didn't go back and say, well, what red flags did I miss? You just can't do that. It's just not fair. Maya Angelou said it best. I did what I knew how to do. And when I knew better, I did better. I wanted this family to know, to reassure themselves, that had they known, had it registered with them at all, that she was in danger of being killed by this psychopathic controlling narcissist, 
that of course they would have come to her aid. They would have called the police, get over there right away. Break the door down if you have to. We'll get there as fast as we can. But they didn't know that. It was important for them to acknowledge and accept the feelings of sadness that can come with a loss. Bottling up your emotions, not facing your sadness head on, can lead those feelings down a dark rabbit hole. Grief is not a mental illness. And that means it's not something you can get over. There is no cure for grief. You just learn to accommodate to it. You learn to adjust to it. And by the way, it doesn't get better. There will be times when the sharp feeling of loss can be just as acute a year later as it is the day you find out about it. What we hope is that those days get fewer and farther between. We hope that instead of focusing on the tragic act of her murder, instead of replaying that movie in your mind, that you begin to focus on and celebrate the process of her life. I mean, she lived for all of these years, and there was so much joy during so many of those years. The hope is that you can focus on that because you do not want her legacy to be pain. You will have emptiness and loneliness. There's this intensified, profound sense that something has been taken from you. And that is a congruent feeling. There's a target for your anger. There's a target for your resentment. You can't get angry at a disease, but you can certainly feel rage towards a human who deprived someone you loved the right to live. This wasn't just a murder victim. She was a beloved individual, beloved by many. She loved her children. She loved to laugh. She could talk to anyone. Her family fondly remembered her beautiful singing voice. She loved belting out the Etta James classic, At Last. Even during my interview with her family, when their emotions were still so raw, they were able to remember the joy she brought them while she was alive. No one deserves this kind of fate, and Michelle certainly did not deserve it. He's taken away a precious sister, sister sister-in-law, and a mother. He's taken away two children's mother and many friends that she has. And we have had so much response of friends we didn't know that she had and people who were acquainted with her. It seemed that every life that she touched, she made a difference. And he's taken that away from everybody. When I asked them what they thought should happen to Mark... Yeah, pretty predictably, their response was an eye for an eye. Honestly, I'd like to see him hung if he snapped her neck, then I think that's the nicest way for him to go. I hope that he suffers. I hope that I hope that he thinks about this every day for the rest of his life, how he took her away from her kids. I can't imagine being a mother not being there for my children. Like I said, I've spoken to many families that have had to deal with the aftermath of a violent crime. This case was one of the hardest. They wanted to go forward with this sit-down interview because they wanted to replace the lies about Michelle with the truth. What he was saying with his character assassination was so toxic They just couldn't bear for it to be out there unchallenged for another minute of another hour of another day. Even through their pain, they wanted to stand up for her. They wanted to speak for her. They wanted to give her a voice from the grave. They would not let him be the one that labeled her. And they did a beautiful job of it. They came with a mission and they accomplished it. And there was still more to come. On next week's final episode, we're going to talk about the trial of Mark Castellano. He had a defense ready. 
And trust me, it will blow your mind. You are not going to believe what you're going to hear. You've been listening to Twisted Love, bringing a murderer to justice. Mystery and murder. Analysis by Dr. Phil. I am Dr. Phil.